we must briefly go over the outline of the first study in order to move into the second study and as a matter of fact recapitulation is a good part of teaching it's not superfluous we're faced with the fact that life is full of conflict and warfare the whole universe apparently is involved in conflict and warfare certainly the human race is and we find this a very real part of our own lives and furthermore it's a very important part of our lives as Christians as Christians we are soldiers called to a warfare so we asked ourselves this question what is the background and who are the opposing forces and I stated that I believe the root cause of all conflict and warfare is rebellion against the righteous government of Almighty God this leads us to the next question how and when did rebellion begin and I said that before answering this question in detail it's necessary to acknowledge two facts first of all the Bible deals primarily mainly with the Adamic race with Adam and his descendants anything else that's in contained in the Bible is in the sense of a frame for the picture but the picture is God's dealings with Adam and his descendants the, pr the frame is important but it's only to present the picture secondly there was an undetermined period in the history of the universe before the creation of Adam and I decided to call this period the pre-Adamic period we looked at Genesis 1 1 and we saw this grand opening statement in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth we noticed that the Hebrew word for God was plural the Hebrew word for heavens was plural and already the Bible reveals plurality in the Godhead and the fact that there is more than one heaven and by cross references to Job and Nehemiah we saw that the scripture reveals that the heavens and their inhabitants were created complete before God created earth this was the order then we looked back at Genesis 1 2 and we saw this statement the earth was without form and void and I stated that was my definite conviction that the earth was not created in that form but that it came to be in that form as a result of tremendous divine judgment that came upon the earth between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2 we saw that the words translated in Genesis 1 2 without form and void are two related Hebrew words tohu and bohu and we looked at other passages in scripture where these words occur and we saw that their association the general meaning that they convey is always of divine wrath judgment and abandonment and so we concluded that there had been something that took place between Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2 which caused divine wrath judgment and in a certain sense abandonment to come upon the earth the most clear statement of all is Isaiah 45 18 that the Lord did not create the earth tohu he didn't create it in that condition therefore something must have happened to bring it into that condition now we'll look at the second sheet in our outline and the opening reference there is to Proverbs the 8th chapter now the 8th chapter of Proverbs is very fascinating and I have to be a little bit on my guard that I don't go into it in too much detail there's one single theme to the whole of the 8th chapter of Proverbs and the theme is wisdom and in this 8th chapter of Proverbs wisdom is presented to us as a person there is no question about that you cannot account for the language in any other way this is the wisdom of God and what I believe with complete uh, conviction is that the wisdom of God is none other than Jesus Christ again we have a revelation of Jesus Christ in his eternal nature before he became uh, the son of Mary born as Jesus of Nazareth uh, if you want a cross reference let me just give you this as a basis for what I'm saying 1st Corinthians 1 24 if you are in Proverbs 8 stay there with one finger at least we'll be coming back 1st Corinthians 1 and verse 24 Paul says we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them who are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God 
and the wisdom of God. Therefore, Christ is the wisdom of God. There are other passages in the New Testament which give the same revelation. So when wisdom is speaking as a person in the 8th chapter of Proverbs, we have the Son, the eternal Word, the second person of the Godhead speaking. And the whole setting is before uh, what we would call the creation of the earth and the beginning of the Adamic race. With this introduction in mind, let's look at verse 22 of Proverbs chapter 8 and following. And we'll read through verse 31. There's a tremendous revelation in these verses. Wisdom is speaking, speaking as a person, and that person is the divine, eternal Son of God. There are some statements here that are so startling that I don't dare to go into them this morning, but we'll just notice them and pass on. Verse 22, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Now, in the beginning nearly always causes our minds to turn back to Genesis 1.1. You see, the same is true of John's Gospel. John 1.1, in the beginning. And that means turn back to Genesis 1.1. Many other passages in Scripture where you read in the beginning, it's a reference to Genesis 1.1. Actually, you know, the Hebrew name for the book of Genesis is Bereshit, which is the opening word in the beginning. So it really means turn to Genesis. That's the cross-reference. So the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Before he ever created anything, he possessed me. I was set up from everlasting. And I can't refrain from telling you that the Hebrew word means I was anointed. I was anointed from eternity. There's so much in that that we just can't go into it. But Jesus was the anointed one before there was any creation. See? He became the Messiah, the anointed one in human history when he came to earth as Jesus of Nazareth. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, another reference to Genesis, or ever the earth was, before there was ever any earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. He is the only begotten of the Father. That's the cross reference in the New Testament, the only begotten. I was begotten, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, this is going further back now, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, all through the processes of creation, from the heavens onwards to the foundation of the earth, first that is, then I was by him as one brought up with him, a delicately nurtured child. See, this is exactly the picture in John 1. The son was in the bosom of the father from eternity. There was this love relationship between father and son in eternity before creation ever took place. I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, <coughs> rejoicing always before him. And now notice verse 31. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. In other words, all creation was moving to one supreme purpose. What was that? The creation of Adam. This is breathtaking to me. I mean, I'm overawed by the thought of the importance that God attaches to my race. And so everything that was done from eternity was done to make the earth a habitable place with the purpose of bringing Adam and his descendants into being. Now this again is in line with what we were studying. God did not create the earth a desolate, waste, void wilderness. That was absolutely contrary to his original purposes. When the Lord created it, his delight was in the habitable parts of the earth and the sons of men. This is in line with Isaiah 45, 18. He did not create it tohu. He didn't create it a voiced, weighed wilderness. Void wilderness. So when it became tohu and bohu, something happened to produce that. There had been a divine intervention in judgment. We can sum this up, and I do so if you want to look in your, near the top of your second outline sheet. The main associations of tohu and bohu are divine displeasure, judgment, 
and abandonment. I think we've established that beyond all shadow of doubt. So that the earth in Genesis 1-2 was, had been the object of divine displeasure, judgment, and abandonment. And I can believe that for millions of years it was just a void, watery, dark, empty waste. Who knows? Certainly I'm not saying that we must accept that conclusion as regards the time element. Now, having established the fact that there had been a divine judgment on the earth before the Adamic race ever came into being, we ask ourselves naturally, what caused this divine judgment? And my answer is given there, primarily, it was the rebellion of Satan. In other words, it's rebellion that brings judgment. And rebellion began long before the Adamic race was here. There was a rebellion that took place that went much further back in the history of the universe. Now let's turn to Colossians for a moment, the first chapter, which gives us another of these Bible insights into a period before the human race began to occupy the earth. Colossians 1 Actually, there are verses here in the first chapter of Colossians which are possibly the most complete outline of the person of Jesus Christ from eternity to eternity. We could perhaps look at them for a moment because it's always good to dwell on the person of Jesus. Colossians 1, uh, verse 13, and reading onwards, pausing to comment every now and then, it says, God hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that's the power of Satan, and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, literally. Then speaking about this Son, this eternal Son of God, it says, in whom we have redemption through His blood. We have redemption in the Son through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now then, we're given a picture of the Son, S-O-N, of course, the Son of God, who is the image of the invisible God. He is the visible showing forth of the person of the Father. He is called in Hebrews 1, the express image of the Father's person. And you remember, even in his earthly life, he said, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Then it says in the second half of Colossians 1.15, the firstborn of every creature, but that is a mistranslation and it obscures the meaning. He is the firstborn before all creation. The contrast is between born and created. Jesus was not created. The scripture says emphatically he's begotten, the only begotten of the Father. And he was begotten before creation ever took place. Then all creation took place through him. John 1, by him were all things made, and without him was not anything made that was made. But he himself was not created. He's divine, he's eternal, he is God himself. Then verse 16, Colossians 1, For by him, but the Greek says, in him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He's the end purpose of all creation. Going on, and then we come back to the 16th verse. And he is before all things. He eternally exists before all things. It's an eternal present. You remember what he said to the Jews of his day, before Abraham was, I am. And that made them very, very angry because they realized he was claiming uh, divinity in that statement. He was claiming to be eternal, which is what he is. Be he is before all things. The second half of Colossians 1.17, by him all things consist. He keeps the whole universe in being. In Hebrews 1 it says he upholds all things by the word of his power. And then in verse 18 we come to the new creation. Now this is not my purpose to go into this in details just now, but it's so fascinating I can't stop short of it. And he is the head of the body. What is the body? The church. Now when a body rises up, the first thing that comes forth is the head, but it's followed by the body. So he's the head of the body, and he's the beginning. The beginning of what? The new order of creation. Because of what? Because he's the first born from the dead. Exactly the same word. The first begotten of the dead. 
He was eternally the first begotten, the only begotten before all creation. Then he became human without losing his divinity, let me hasten to add. He became the substitute for the sins of the Adamic race, died our death, was buried, and the third day the Father raised him from the dead, and he became at that point the first begotten of the dead, the beginning of the new order, the head of the church, the body which was to follow him in death, burial, and resurrection to come forth as his body that in all things he might have the preeminence, that in everything he might be first, first in the initial creation and first in the new creation which comes out of the tomb. So this is a picture of Jesus, as I say, from eternity to eternity. And the emphasis is that in every phase he has the preeminence, the first place. Now, speaking about the first creation, which is the point of our reference at the moment, verse 16 we are given a picture of the heavenly creation and the heavenly orders before earth came into being. For by him were all things that are created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. The visible are the things that we see, the invisible are the heavenly things that we cannot see, but they're just as real as the visible. That doesn't make them unreal in any sense. They're not visible to our eyes. And the invisible things that were created before the earth are here defined in four successive orders, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And I believe we have here an order of the, the rule of the universe in descending order. The highest order in the created universe is the throne order. And you remember in Revelation 4 and 5 we are introduced to the throne realm. When John was caught up into heaven, he said, the first thing I saw was a throne. Then he saw the one that sat on the throne, who was God, and then he saw round about the throne four and twenty thrones. The King James calls them seats, but they're thrones. This is the throne order. It's the highest order of the created universe. Then, uh, dominions. The Greek word is lordships. Then, principalities. But a more accurate, modern English word would be rulerships. And then, powers, but the correct word is authority, rulerships, and the realms of their authority. So we have this descending order, thrones, lordships, rulerships, and under the rulerships, the respective areas of their authority. Every rulership has a certain defined area of authority. It has areas in which it is, has authority and it has limits set to its authority. This is a principle that goes all through Scripture. I suppose at least half a dozen times in the New Testament you'll find the phrase principalities and powers. This is old Elizabethan English. And I would suggest that you think of it in this way as rulerships and the realms or areas of their authority. I think you'll find it will always make sense. Now we'll come back to this in greater detail later on. The fact that Scripture now reveals, which we are going to deal with, is that when rebellion broke out in the universe, it broke out on the level of principalities. Did not apparently break out on the throne level, nor on the level of dominions or lordships, but on the level of principalities. You'll find that everywhere the rebellious spiritual forces are spoken of in the Scriptures, they're always called principalities and powers. There has never been rebellion on the throne level, nor on the lordship level, but there was rebellion long before the human race came into being in the principality level. And the Bible reveals to us certain specific persons who are named as being princes or having principalities. You see, the word archangel means a ruling angel. The Greek word for rule is arche. And that's the word that's translated principality in every place. It's rulership. So it's angels who had rulership. That's why, as our sister pointed out from her reference in a previous study, this was called the angelic period before, because it was the period when angels were ruling even on earth. Now, uh, the scripture reveals by name three archangels, three angel princes, three ruling angels. And they all have an important part to play in the history of the human race. 
So I want to take a few moments now with you to look at them. The first one that we look at is the one that was called Lucifer. And he is referred to by name in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. Now we'll come back to this passage a little later. So we will not dwell on it now. <coughs> How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now, in English, the word Lucifer means the light bringer. And uh, in Hebrew, the word is normally translated the shining one. Uh, so this is the title of one of these great ruling angels, the shining one. In fact, he was obviously, even by heaven's standards, a person of absolutely outstanding personal glory and beauty. So much so that his name indicates this. He was the shining one. Remember, that's what Lucifer means. Do you ever refer to uh, matches as Lucifers? At least we did once upon a time, come the days of Charles Dickens, I suppose, or something like that. Well, that's why, because they're light bringers, you see. And this was the original title of this particular ruling angel. Now, we're going to study his career in some detail a little further on. But then we go on to the next one, who is Gabriel. Now, Gabriel has a meaning too. Gabriel means God is mighty. And he is referred to two or three times, both in the Old Testament and in the New. I'd like to look with you at these references for a moment. In Daniel, the 8th chapter, and the 16th verse, Daniel is being given a vision which relates to the end time. And he says, in the course of this vision, I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which was a river, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Gabriel was a ruling angel. And then in the ninth chapter of Daniel, the 21st verse, Daniel had a further encounter with Gabriel. He says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Notice an interesting thing that angels fly. I'll point out a significant um, result of that later. And then Gabriel is mentioned twice by name in the New Testament, each time in the opening chapter of Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 1 verse 19 we just look at these references without pausing over them Zacharias had gone in to minister as a Levite in the temple and he had a vision of an angel and he said who are you and the angel answering said I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee glad tidings it seems that any major intervention of God in human affairs is always associated with Gabriel and then when, in verse 26, he was sent with a message of the Annunciation, as it's called, to the Virgin Mary. Luke 1, 26, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, and so on. The third of the ruling angels who's mentioned is Michael. And the name Michael means who is like God. You'll notice that the ending L, E L is one of the Hebrew words for God. Every time you see that in Hebrew, it is God. Every Hebrew name that contains El contains a reference to God, and you find hundreds of Hebrew names with that word in. Mi ka El, who is like God. That's the meaning of Michael. Now, Michael is referred to in Daniel, in Jude, in Revelation. Let's look quickly at these references. Daniel, the 10th chapter, The 13th verse. Uh, we'll go into this incident later in detail, so we'll not pause there too long. Daniel 10, 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. He was one of the chief or prince or ruling angels. And then in verse 21, the same person is speaking, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Now remember that Daniel was a Jew, and it was as a Jew that 
this other angel was speaking and he says, Michael, your prince, in other words, the particular angel or archangel charged with dealing with Israel. And this is brought out more clearly in Daniel, the 12th chapter and the first verse. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, being Israel, the children of Israel. So Michael is the great angel, one of whose important responsibilities is to see to the well-being, the protection, and God's provision for Israel. And every time you read about Michael, you can be pretty sure that it's got a close reference to Israel. Now, Michael is referred to twice in the New Testament. It's interesting to look there. Jude's epistle, which is the last book before Revelation. The epistle of Jude, the ninth verse, where we have a rather fascinating little lifting of the curtain on the unseen realm. It's just lifted for a moment and dropped again. We don't see as much as maybe we would have liked to. It says, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. Remember, Moses was buried by the Lord's special direction in a place which has never been revealed. And it would appear that Michael had something to do with the burial of the body of Moses. And the devil was right on the scene, contending the right to the body of Moses. A fascinating scene. I wish I could tell you more about it, but I can't. But here is Michael. And of course, Moses, an Israelite, the great commander of God's people, Israel, there was Michael on the scene, watching over God's purposes for Moses. Then in Revelation 12, 7, we have the final reference to Michael there. And we'll be coming back to this passage at length later on. Mike, uh, Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, which is one of the titles of the devil. Notice Michael has angels under him who are called his angels. So we have this established fact that there were at least three special ruling angels called commonly archangels or great princes. Principalities, you see it links up with that word. Lucifer, meaning the shining one. Gabriel, meaning God is mighty. And Michael, meaning who is like God. Now, in this connection, I want to suggest to you two things which seem to me possible. I'm certainly not saying they're established facts, but I'm presenting them to you for your consideration. Uh, we're going beyond exact specified statement into what I could call a possible inference. I would suggest that it's possible that each of these three archangels commanded one third of the total angels. I'll show you why in a moment. And if that is true, and many Bible commentators believe that, then we have the fact that the angels apparently from eternity were divided up into three groups. And I would suggest to you that these may correspond to the three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We do know that there are certain specific angels which Jesus called my Father's angels. And he also speaks in another place about his own angels. So we see there is a direct relationship in a certain sense between angels and the persons of the Godhead. So there is a suggestion of a, of a division into three main groups, each with its main leader, whose names apparently are given, Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael, and the possibility that each of these three groups is at the disposal of one person of the Godhead. 